This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. That's Ninky Van Damaro. Ninky Van Damaro. Yes. I get it right? Okay. And yes. she's Dutch. I never met anybody from Holland I didn't <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> and this is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. And today we're going to do hmm, what? Science in Manoa. Uh, and we're going to find out about astronomy. There's a, some big deal happening at IFA in, in the next few weeks, isn't it? We're going to go, uh, we're gonna go uh, film it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Roy Gall told me about yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's my office neighbor. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, so your office is in IFA? Uh, yes. Okay, and you're an astronomer from, from Holland, may I say mm -hmm. Holland instead of the Netherlands? Is yeah, that fair? Yeah, that's fine. Politically correct? <laughs> <laughs> and you studied in Leiden, Leiden University, which is a big observatory, which is world famous, world class, and you came here, mm -hmm. only to waltz right into the middle of the TMT dispute. Yes. How do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, that was that was very strange because actually, so I arrived end of November 2015. So my first working week, that was first <laughs> week of December. That was when yeah. the judge decided that yeah. the permit had to be revoked, oh. and that basically the whole procedure of obtaining the permit had to be redone. So, well, <laughs> welcome, Nikki. <laughs> yeah, and I had heard about it, of course. Like the the, the TMT story was was a big issue in in astronomy. Um, but suddenly it got a whole lot closer, and yeah, it's yeah. been interesting to follow interesting it in the last follow, two, two yeah. years. I'm really glad that the permit has now been granted again. Yeah, and yeah. Not good uh, that it'll actually happen. It, yeah. It's still, yeah, there's still a couple of steps to, ta yeah. to take, but I, I have confidence that. Yeah, not good. TMT not will good. be built. There's some people think they're going to fight it forever, but you know, there is the law. Yeah. We do have the law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but that, you know, that's not your concern, actually. You're into mm -hmm. exoplanets and other amazing things in the universe and beyond the universe. You're not limited to universal, you're universal plus, aren't you? Um, I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to, the universe. Universe. The universe is everything. Maybe uh, okay. you, you mean the solar system. Solar system. Right, yeah. No, the solar system, plus. solar yeah. system is very yeah. tiny part of, well, the Milky Way, and then the Milky Way is part, a tiny part of the, of the universe. So. Yeah. Why, why yeah. did you choose to study this? Um, because I was so I was good in physics and math in high school, and I started to look into possibilities like what can I study. I went to visit universities, and my father was a physicist too, so he was very happy oh, about well, that. Oh, runs in the family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, and then I heard that you could study a combination physics and astronomy because yeah. they are they are closely related. Yeah, sure. Um, Astrophysics. It, yeah, yeah, and that sounded very interesting. So that's when I started and. Um, just, I started to do this double major, and by the end of my bachelor studies, I was I was caught. I was like, "This is what astronomy. This is what I want to do. It's so fascinating." Why? Why is it fascinating? What is about it that fascinates you? Um, it's because there are so many things that we don't really understand yet in the universe, and at the same time, we have the tools to study it. Um, and what is yeah, what is so cool is that you need only a tiny little bit of information, like one picture with a telescope, maybe a very long exposure picture, but still, yeah. or one spectrum that you're measuring. Yeah. And then because the laws of physics are the same everywhere, we can actually use that in order to learn from that tiny bit of information. Yeah. And then we combine it with what other people have done. We try to put it in a bigger picture there. It's incredible how much we can learn just with those. It sounds like it's a gratification in yes. being a detective. Taking one little scintilla <laughs> of information, yeah, that's, and <laughs> that's building a, good a theory on, and then validating the yeah. theory. This is really exciting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, physics is like that in general. But gee whiz! Now you said something I want to spend a little time on, and that you said, and I quote, I quote this: mm -hmm. "The laws of physics of physics are the same everywhere, and mm -hmm. everywhere by everywhere you mean everywhere." Yeah. And that includes the periodic table of elements. Yes. So if it's not on the periodic table of elements, it isn't ever anywhere. Uh, well, who knows? Maybe the periodic table is not entirely complete. Okay, we I, don't I, know that. I take your there, point. Yeah. There are definitely elements that are very unstable, yeah. that are impossible, well, definitely impossible yeah. to find on Earth. Yeah. Uh, but they may form in very exotic environments and may survive for, I don't know, a millionth of a second. Yeah. So, and we don't know about them. And, and we don't know about them. So the, the table may not be complete, but whatever is on the table or should be on the table, that's constant 
everywhere. Be, yes. In, in the solar system, outside the solar, yeah. in, in the whole universe, yeah. everywhere we can possibly imagine. Yeah, so the ratios will be different because they depend on the environment yeah. and because all the elements are in principle formed in stars. Yeah. Uh, because stars uh, burn hydrogen and form heavier elements. Yeah. And uh, once we get beyond iron, then we need actually a supernova or other exotic yeah. uh, places to, to form even heavier elements. Yeah. Uh, but all of that is something we can understand. Yeah. And that is governed by the laws of physics. Yeah, so. well, there's something comforting about it to yeah. know that what, whatever you're doing, what, whatever far reaches you're, you're visiting, mm -hmm. the rules are essentially yeah. the same. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, and the other thing is, um, the other thing is chemistry. And, and mm -hmm. Now, we, you talk about astrochemistry, right? Yes. That, in fact, that's a big thing for you. What is it? Um, so astrochemistry is, formation of molecules in space. So we're no longer talking about elements, but actually molecules that um, interact with each other and exchange atoms and bond in electron bonds, etc. Um, They're more complex than atoms. They're more complex yeah, than... Yeah, I mean, a, a molecule consists of multiple atoms. Multiple atoms That's and structured in a certain way. And they are structured in a certain way, exactly. Yeah. And um, astrochemistry is uh, it's, it's interesting for many reasons. So. There is a link with origin of life. I mean, eventually molecules have to uh, grow. Have We're to all made of molecules. We're all made of molecules, and they have to have been formed at some point, becoming more and more complex. Yeah. And maybe eventually form things like DNA. Um, so that's one part of it. But another really cool thing about astrochemistry is studying molecules allows us to study conditions. So we are studying, well, CO is a very simple example. CO is the most abundant molecule in space after molecular hydrogen. And so it, it helps us to trace densities. CO is carbon oxygen? Uh, car yeah, carbon oxygen, carbon monoxide. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and it's, um, it's a molecule that's very easy to form and is very abundant everywhere. But you wouldn't want it in your garage. No, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. But, it's, uh, but it can help us to trace uh, gas densities. Yeah. And that is something that we need in order to calculate physics and dynamics in a certain system. Okay. But then there are other molecules that are telling us something about processes that are happening. So, uh, for example, there are locations where CO is frozen out because of the low temperature in combination with a certain density. Frozen, what does frozen out mean? Uh, frozen out means that it's frozen out onto the dust grains. So the dust grains have an icy layer of CO molecules. Yeah. So that means there's no more CO in the gas phase. Um, dust grain is a particle of matter? Yes. Out in space? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then once CO is frozen out, other chemical reactions will occur. And then suddenly a molecule like N2H plus can be formed. Which so is? Uh, nitrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen. Ah, uh, we speak a little else at our dinner table, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. I encourage that. <laughs> no, I know it sounds very exciting, but it's, it's a molecule that, that we like because it tells us, hey, that is an area where CO is frozen out. So it must be very cold there. Yeah. So and that, so it tells us something about the conditions about, about the what you're looking at. Yeah, so this is yeah. a big thing because if you if you can if you can look at the molecules in faraway places and see how they're reacting and how they're yeah. developing, um, th then you can find out about that place. This is very important um, in discovering about that place. And um, uh, I guess the two two things come to mind is one is how do you do that? <laughs> how do you look at this molecule millions of miles away and figure out what's going on with it? Okay, so a molecule um, actually emits uh, photons, so it, it, it emits light, light at very specific frequencies or very specific wavelengths, yeah. it's equivalent. Yeah. Um, so that means that if you observe at this f uh, wavelength range yeah. where that molecule is emitting, you can detect a so-called molecular line, uh, so you need spectroscopy in order of to course. do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the so how, how do you do that? You have, you have to have telescopes. The telescopes help yes. you do that, mm -hmm. and then you look at the at the frequency and the wavelength yeah. and all that of the of the light. Then you can discuss discover what what's happening with the molecule. And this, I want to tell you something you don't know. This is closely related to photography mm -hmm. because you are a photographer. In a she's way, She's a yes. bike rider. <laughs> all Dutch people are bike riders, and she's a photographer. Yeah. Yeah. 
So this connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Although with molecules, it's it's really looking at these very specific wavelengths. So in with with a photograph, you usually take like a broad range yeah, of wavelengths. Yeah. So when you get the data for this, I mean, you have to have a you have to have a telescope. And yeah. why do I feel that Subaru it helps you and Keck helps you? Is you get the data from Keck mm -hmm. and, and Subaru on Mauna Kea, yeah. and this is the data. You get it in a spreadsheet form or in a database form. <laughs> How do you get that data? Um, so the way that a telescope works is that um, the owners of the telescope, which yeah. are usually countries yeah. or in some cases institutes, yeah. universities, um, the astronomers that work in those countries or at those institutes, they have access to that data. To the, using it from the telescope from the telescope yeah, yeah. but it's in, um, it's in computer format yeah yes yes okay. but this is even before you have any data okay. because the telescope is not randomly observing and you just pick out what you want because right. there the sky is way too big for way that too big. Yeah. so uh, what you do if you want to observe something is that you write an observing proposal where you say this is what i want to do yeah this is why it's important yeah. this is why it's interesting yeah um this is how my telescope settings should look like, yeah. like this instrument, this wavelength yeah. range, uh, this exposure time, etc. Yeah. And then also, important, how much time do I need? So you need to estimate that. You cannot That's just good. say, oh, give me, you know, give me half a year and yeah. I'll, I'll see how much I'm going to use. No, yeah. you have to specify how much you need. Yeah. Then uh, this is usually a cycle once a semester or once a year uh, that everyone sends in their proposals. Yeah. Then a committee will read all those proposals and grade them. A committee in the consortium for the telescope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they decide which proposals get granted time. Then, if you get the time, yeah, it either you go there yourself or it will be observed for you. And you get an email saying, "Hey, your data has been observed. Here's the download link, and That's you download simple. it to That's your simple. computer." So, and you've made proposals like this, and yes. they've been granted, and yes. then you have the benefit of this data on for a length of time. It's not yes. just one observation's a length of time. Yeah. How many yeah. years do you get it for? Uh, it depends on the telescope. Mm -hmm. So the, um, uh, I believe the Keck telescope has two years proprietary time. So that's the time that I'm the only person who can download that data. Yeah. Uh, the Alma telescope, which is in Chile, that's an, another one that I use. You get it from them too. Yeah, Whoa. because uh, Alma is a, a global yeah. uh, collaboration of yeah. countries, so yeah. no matter where, yeah. yeah. Let's say in, within the US or in the Netherlands or anywhere in Europe, I can use it. Oh, and, that's uh, terrific. Now suppose yeah. I went there, Ninky, and um, I, I said, my name is Jay, I know, Nink <laughs> I know Ninky. <laughs> and I really like astronomy and I, I like to have some observation time too. What do you mm -hmm. say, guys? What would they say to me? Uh, they would say, write an observing <laughs> proposal and send it uh, you think I at might the deadline. Get observation time. It, yeah. Yes, <laughs> in principle, everyone can apply um, because I well, I already mentioned you have to be related to a country or an institute. Yeah. But the, most telescopes also offer so-called open time, which is for everyone. That's great. There's yeah. a democratization there. It is. <laughs> I, I have to emphasize that it's very competitive because yeah. there are uh, countries where. The, astronomers are working yeah. that are not part of these collaborations. Yeah. So a lot of people, like Australia, for example, apply for this open time. Okay. So you would still have to uh, well, go up against maybe you these, these astronomers. <laughs> uh, you know, I feel, I feel it's, a, it's a real, um, you know, it's, it's a challenge for me. And that's why we're going to take a one minute break, Ninky. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go and write my proposal. We'll come back in one minute and continue <laughs> this conversation. And when we do, I'm going to ask you, what do you do with all that data? How do you make sure. it work? We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. So we do it. 
Yes, sir, we're back with Nikki Vendamaro of IFA, an astronomer. Wow, fabulous. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, ask, I mean, Hawaii, you, you came from Leiden, which is world class, everybody knows, and you came to Hawaii. Why, why, what's about Hawaii that makes it so special that, you know, would advance your career and your, and your inquiry into astronomy? Uh, yeah, so Hawaii uh, has the very special advantage that we have access to 10% of the telescope time of the telescopes on Mauna Kea. Um, oh, that's the deal. Yeah. So UH has 10% of the time. Yes. Okay. So the, the other 90% is divided over the owners of the telescope. So, for example, Subaru is a Japanese telescope. So yeah. most of the users are Japan, yeah. uh, are Japanese. And um, uh, Keck has several owners on the mainland uh, where, where astronomers are proposing. But we have 10% of observing time. And, well, we don't have that many astronomers, so it's... It's you get a lot. relatively easy to get yeah. a lot of observing time. So this time. is a very so this attractive is a, this point. This is very attractive for yeah, my yeah. research, yeah. Yeah, would TMT help you? Would you get, would, if you had time on TMT, would that help your scientific inquiry? Uh, probably, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my interest is, is not so much in uh, the optical near-infrared, which is what TMT is going to do. Yes. I actually look mostly in longer wavelengths, radio wavelength. Ah, uh, okay, okay. A, ra a radio telescope. Kind. Yeah. So here we are, and it's all laid out there in your computer, and you've downloaded it from, from Keck, from Subaru, and from Chile, too. No? Yeah, Alma. And, and so, oh, uh, Alma, yeah, yeah. Alma. No. What is A-L-M-A? What does that stand yeah. for? Atacama Large Millimeter uh, Array. I knew that. Now they know it, too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you got these three things, including Alma, and they're all laid out on your computer. Mm -hmm. What do you do with them in order to make scientific sense out of them? Um, well, that is a, it can be a very long, painful process. Yeah. Uh, so we always have to reduce data and calibrate data yeah. because what we measure is not um, the actual information that we can use. So we have to convert it to units. We have to get rid of disturbances by the atmosphere, yeah. um, all those kinds and of things. And that's up to you. You have to make algorithms yeah. and formulas to do that. Yeah, well, a lot of software luckily exists ah, already, ah. so it's, I don't have to reinvent the wheel because many people are using these yeah, good, good, And they share. Yeah, yeah. This is very nice it's, about uh, science in general. Yes, yes. But it's, uh, it, it always depends a little bit on the science that you want to do with it, how you are doing your reduction. Yeah. So that's why, yeah. in principle, you still do it yourself. Um, it's the then, end of the day, what comes out? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's either images, yeah. so to the image, uh, or in case of Alma, it's actually uh, 3D images. Uh -huh. So it has, well, it has X and Y, and then it has the third dimension, which is frequency or wavelength. Because Alma allows you to study a lot of wavelengths at the same time yeah. and get those spectra That's out of there, exciting. what we were talking about before. You can get a 3D modeling. You get a 3D, uh, yeah. 3D map with, with all that uh, molecule information. So okay. we can detect different molecules and even detect uh, their velocities, so the way that it's moving. Yeah. And now it's up to you to take that data, that those maps, yeah. and figure out, I'm, I'm just making a guess list here, mm -hmm. Um, about the exoplanets, uh, planets, mm -hmm. about the disks and mm -hmm. where they fit on the exoplanets, mm -hmm. um, and about their creation and their evolution over yeah. millions of years. Mm -hmm. it, and what do you do after lunch? I'm uh, only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do sleep sometimes. <laughs> no, so as soon as, soon as I have those images, uh, what, what we usually do is, is try, we write models that are... Um, where we put in the physics, and then we let it we let it calculate, and then we compare those models to the data. And um, if it matches, that means that oh, our model seems to be consistent. So maybe our model is representing the real, the real thing, the nature of what we're looking at. Yeah. Uh, writing those models is also a very lengthy process, uh, but that is that's primarily what we do. Yeah. Uh, so, and, um, so you're getting confirmation. <laughs> yeah. you, you make a th theory, yeah. you get confirmation, and then presumably you publish. Yes. Where do you publish? Um, astrophysical Journal, uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics, and uh, a monthly notices Royal Academic Society. Those are the three main astronomy journals. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, also, I've had one publication in Science a couple of years ago. Uh, 
Because Science I, magazine. Science, Science magazine. Yeah, this yeah. is a big deal. Because it was a very big discovery. Yeah. 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 And what was your conclusion in that article? Um, I mean, if you, we don't have a lot of time here. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. Well, I can tell you what the discovery was. Uh, so we had observed a disk with Anna, and uh, what we found was that the disk was actually not circular, not pancake-like, which is how we always imagine disks to be. Yeah. No, what we saw was that the dust particles on that disk were actually concentrated on one side. They were all gathered on one side of the disk. It was asymmetric. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, we could also observe the gas through molecular lines, and that one was showing this sort of pancake structure. So all yeah. the gas was still distributed. But the dust was concentrating. And this is super important for our understanding of planet formation. Um, because in order to form planets, including dust exoplanets. Including exoplanets, uh, dust grains need to um, collide and stick together to grow to larger and larger particles. Yeah. And well, this is a slow process, but we have models sort of predicting it. Um, predict the development, the growth of a planet. Predicting the, the growth by of a planet. Gravity and, and uh, no, astrochemistry? No, no, no. Long or? before uh, gravity kicks in. This oh. is, um, th these are Van der Waals forces, electric forces. These are tiny little attraction forces that keep dust grains together. Um, so this is at the very start. Dust grains are a micrometer in size and they grow up to millimeter, centimeter very slowly. Um, but we can observe this growth by looking at different wavelengths. So we can we can see where the larger grains are. In this case, all the large grains were located in one place of a disk. So that means that they are growing very rapidly there. Um, and this is what we call a dust trap. And that was something that was predicted by theory, that dust traps must exist because they help us to grow planets. Yes. Uh, but it had never been observed before. Yes. So that was the discovery, so, and that's, that's why it a, got published in Science. Yeah, yeah, that's a major thing in, yeah. in terms of the fact that you know you could find about, you could find the development of the planets, what caused it. You know, you, and it's just logic. Right? Mm -hmm. so you take all that data, it's logic. <laughs> and now, an exoplanet is just a planet outside the solar system. Is that what yes. it is? Yes. And I, and I told you that uh, one of our young guests here, his name was Christopher Lindsay, mm -hmm. at an Iolani school. Mm -hmm. He was a sophomore in Iolani yeah. school, invented or rather discovered an exoplanet yeah. that hadn't been discovered before. Yeah. It's really remarkable. Yeah, that's this really is a very cool. interesting field you're in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's talk about some. Let's talk about the Science Cafe, which mm -hmm. you spoke on on September 19th, as I recall. Yeah, um, uh, something, yeah. something recently. And, um, and you spoke to a group of scientists and science uh, enthusiasts mm -hmm. uh, at, in, in Kaimuki at the regular meeting of the Science Cafe. What was it like? What did you tell them? Uh, so I mostly talked about the sort of the, the most fundamental question in astronomy or maybe even in humanity, which is this question, are we unique? Are, are humans unique? Uh, and the Earth itself, is it unique? Um, because it's Sort of historically, we, we like to put ourselves in the center and we like to compare everything to ourselves. Yeah. Like we are normal and the rest is like hopefully following the same normal. Um, and if you, if you, even if you look at the history of astronomy, that is very uh, obvious that, that people are taking that stand because people used to say, oh, the Earth is in the center of the universe and everything else is orbiting us. Um, <laughs> I then, think I rid of that notion a long yeah. time ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got rid of that, but it's still, it was around for a long time. Yeah. And then, but even after that, when they put the sun in the center of our solar system yeah. and the Earth orbiting it, okay, well, fine. But, uh, but then maybe our sun was still very special. Yeah. And then when we realized we were actually part of the Milky Way and we are just you know, somewhere in the outskirts of the Milky Way, not really special. Again, we make our, well, we're making ourselves less important. That's fine. However, then we started to discover exoplanets. And so planets around other stars. Um, and what we are looking for are planets just like us. And they are actually pretty hard to find. Yeah. Because what we find primarily are these hot Jupiters, which are very massive planets, very close to the sun. So it's a complete different configuration than our own solar system. So that, that kind of raises the question, are we, maybe we are more unique than we are, than yeah. uh, we, we thought. Origin of life elsewhere. Yeah, that, would, that is the second part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you need, indeed, you need certain conditions in order to even have life. Uh, I, I mentioned that also in my talk, the, the, the habitable zone which is the region where water is liquid. So temperature and pressure are just right so that water is liquid. So it's possible. 
And that's possible. And we, we've discovered planets like that, that are in the habitable zone, where water is liquid. So maybe well, life is With a is cocktail, the cocktail is, is, it could give rise to that. Let's look at some of your slides that you used at mm -hmm. the Science Cafe before we close here. And why don't you describe what we're looking at? So that's your title, title <laughs> format, yeah? yeah? That was your big question. We went from there to, ah, life elsewhere. Yeah. They don't look like that, though. <laughs> Maybe they do. <laughs> uh, we, don't, we don't know how they look like. I mean, we haven't found them yet. <laughs> okay, what's next? Uh, I'm significant. Yeah, I'm significant. It is, well, it is, it is illustrating the point that I was making before. We are, we're thinking we are significant, we are important, right. and maybe we are just really generic. Right. We don't know. It's right. really hard to say how normal we really are. Yeah. yeah. But you have to think about those things. Yeah. What's this now? This disk? Uh, no, this is the solar system. The whole thing the whole, that we yeah. know in this around this sun? Yeah, yeah. So we are the third planet uh, around the sun. We're pretty small. Yeah, we yeah. are pretty small. Yeah. 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 And the one with the rings, that's Saturn up in yeah. the foreground? Okay, what else we got? And what's that? Uh, that's the Milky Way, as oh. seen from, well, how we imagine how it looks like from outside. So the whole, our, our solar system is where the arrow is. Our solar system is one of those tiny little dots that the arrow is pointing at, yeah. yes. Big question though, Ninky. What's at the center? What's that bright light at the center? Is that a big sun or something? Uh, no, that is the bulge where a lot of stars are concentrated. But then we, we know that in the very center of that, there is a, there is a supermassive black hole. Uh, yeah. I mean, we in the center that. of that white hot yeah. spot. Yeah. So, I mean, how many? Do you know how many um, uh, solar systems are in this Milky Way? Uh, well, we know there are about a hundred million stars, and okay. uh, statistics tell us that, on average, each star has at least one planet. So uh, that's a hundred million planet. Oh no, a hundred. Yeah, at, 100 least, mil at least a hundred. At least a hundred million planets. Yeah. yeah. I think you have a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have time. <laughs> you do. Yeah. It's great to talk to you, Ninky. It's really yeah. wonderful. I'm so glad. And we're making a movie for OC16 mm -hmm. of your talk. It will include some of this discussion, too. Okay. But on the other hand, it's not over. I mean, not for <laughs> you and not for us about you. So I'd like to have more of this conversation later, if it's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Ninky. Great Thank to you. talk to you. How great do you say goodbye you. in, in uh, Dutch? Um, dag. Put it Goedendag. Goedendag. I can yeah. do that. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>